Um, my name is Julia Sizek, and I am the postdoc here at the Social Science Matrix. And today, um, we are extremely excited for this um, important event that is about a topic that is, uh, you know, very politically relevant in California. As we were discussing right before we started, uh, the votes on Prop 1 are counting, which is, of course, an issue uh, relevant to the system of conservatorship, which is what we're here to discuss today. So you likely already know a little bit about the system of conservatorship, a um, legal infrastructure and medical system that has developed in order to take care of people that have been deemed to be gravely disabled. Conservatorship is a very hidden system, and it rarely makes the news aside from Britney Spears, who is a very famous case. But it's a system that is both very important and very hidden, one that our um, guest today, Alex Barnard, knows very well. And uh, Dr. Barnard is a graduate of the sociology department here, so we are especially happy to welcome him back to say hello. Um, this event is part of our California Spotlight series, which addresses topics of interest to residents of the Golden State. So. Um, we also do have some other upcoming events here at Matrix, um, some of which might be of interest to those of you who are attending this event for various reasons. So um, tomorrow, which is March 19th, we will be having an event um, with Nick Romeo called The Alternative, How to Build a Just Economy. On Wednesday, we will be having an event called New Directions in Greening Infrastructure about the uh, energy transition. Um, on April 1st, which will be after spring break, which is next week, we will be having an event um, on a book called Nature Made Economy, Cod Capital and the Great Economization of the Ocean. On April 4th, another book event on um, the gender of capital. And then uh, once we approach the end of the semester, we'll be having some events on um, caste education and social struggle in modern India, as well as a book event on Puta Life, Seeing Latinas Working Sex by Berkeley professor Juana Maria Rodriguez. And you can, of course, find our other events on our Berkeley, on our website, which is matrix.berkeley.edu. Um, and then just before I uh, introduce our moderator today, just a note for the folks who are online. Um, if you want to ask a question during the event, please put it in the Q&A box. And uh, if you're having some sort of technical issue and you aren't able to hear someone or you're having some sort of problem like that, put it in the chat and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Yes, so, okay, so now I will introduce Jonathan Simon, who will be moderating today for us. Um, he joined the Berkeley Law Faculty in 2003 as part of the JDJSP in Legal Studies programs. He teaches in the areas of criminal law, criminal procedure, criminology, legal studies, and the sociology of law. His scholarship concerns the role of crime and criminal justice in governing contemporary societies, risk in the law, and the history of the interdisciplinary study of law. His published works include over 70 articles and book chapters and three monographs, which I will list here, Poor Discipline, Parole in the Social Control of the Underclass, Governing Through Crime, How the War on Crime Transformed American Democracy and Created a Culture of Fear, and finally, uh, mass incarceration on trial, a remarkable court decision, and the future of prisons in America. And so without any further ado, I will turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks so much, Julia. And let me extend my welcome as well to the Matrix audience here in the building, as well as to our, our audience online. I hope I'm coming through clearly enough. If I'm not, Julia will certainly signal me, and I'll try to improve it. Uh, I'm very excited about this conversation. Um, there are a few topics that have animated as many of us in California for as long as this one, and we have a terrific panel to educate us today. So I want to sort of get to them very quickly. But let me start by saying this. In a little more than 20 years now of teaching legal studies here at Berkeley, I've never ceased to be amazed at how much Americans in general, and I think Californians maybe in particular, love law, and especially law in the books, and how convinced we are that if you get law right, everything will follow, that you want to change society, you need to change the law. And so, you know, we can just look at our history, whether it's prohibition or more recent wars on drugs, 
segregating society or desegregating society, creating a legal right to abortion or ending Roe as we know it, have all been demands made by people who fervently believed that we would live in a better world if we could change what the law is on the books. Um, and if you think about it, there are few areas in certainly recent history where I think a few areas of public interest and public policy uh, that have drawn quite as much of this, you might say, mythical belief in the power of law to do either good or evil than the issues around civil commitment, conservatorship that we are addressing today. Um, many of you know that in 1969, California was one of the leading, maybe the leading state to pass a landmark law revising how the state exercises its truly awesome sovereign power to civilly commit people to coerce them sometimes into custody or into treatment or into some combinations thereof. Um, and that law is attributed by various people uh, as having transformed uh, uh, California society in, in, in many, many ways. Um, and ever since that, over 50 years ago, now 55, uh, we have passed numerous laws. If you think that we don't have enough laws uh, uh, in this area, I first of all urge you to read the book and 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 talk to Lauren, and I'm going to introduce them properly in a moment. But one of the things that makes it so interesting to me is that not only do we really care about this law and the related laws, but today we attribute many of our most persistent evils in our state to having gotten this law either wrong or not right enough. And that includes unhousedness, that includes rampant public drug use and drug sales in the center of many of our large cities. It includes uh, mass incarceration. That was uh, motivated me to write an article on this and opine on how we could solve these problems, as well as seemingly more mundane problems like uh, automobile break-ins, property crimes, retail theft, et cetera. So in a way, uh, changing the law of conservatorship, civil commitment, has the glow of a panacea to, to many today who think that if we could get it right. Now, I've spent much of my career sort of trying to show Berkeley undergraduates, for the most part, that that story about law in the books is at best a myth, and that it's really the law and the action that matters. And there's a lot that goes with that. It, one message is whether you won or lost the battle over law in the books, things are just beginning because they're, we really don't know what that law on the books uh, is going to do and reversing it, how it's going to do as well. Notwithstanding that background knowledge and the experience I should have had, as I said, I wrote my own ar law review article on this topic arguing that mass incarceration was such a horrible evil that we ought to delve back into the law and try to get the balance right uh, between freedom and co coercion in the form of prison. And again, I would say, having now read Alex's book more carefully and listening to more survivors and their family members, that there was a huge amount of naivete to think that we could just give judges clear guidelines or even fancy terms like dignity or values like dignity and expect change to follow in any kind of automatic way. So in my experience, if you want to break out of the enormous power that myths, rational myths, since we're in a sociology related adjacent space, we might describe them as, especially the myth of legality that changing the law in the books is the key to changing society. Um, there's only two ways to get away from those myths in my experience. One is by deep empirical research uh, that forces you to overcome your assumptions and the assumptions of the people that encouraged you to go out in the field and living and experiencing the dilemmas uh, of this system directly through your loved ones uh, and through your own struggle to, uh, to foster their lives and well-being. And we are very privileged today to have two people who can speak exactly to those sources of knowledge. And I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. Um, Alex Bernard on my far left here is an assistant professor of sociology at NYU. As you noted, uh, Julia, he holds a PhD in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley. His work examines cross-national differences in the trajectory of people with severe mental illness between different institutions of care and control. His book, this is it, Conservatorship Inside California's System of Coercion and Care for Mental Illness was published by Columbia University Press in 2023. 
He is currently working on another book tentatively titled Mental States Ordering Psychiatric Disorder in France. And I'll note that he had done a lot of research in France when he wrote this book, so it's already informed in many ways by a, a cross-cultural knowledge that most of us ignore or don't have. To my immediate uh, left is uh, Lauren, um, and I'm sorry, my notes here just give you a first name, but I know you've got a, a, a last name as, as well, and I will get to that in a moment. Here we go. Uh, Lauren is the mom of four sons. The oldest has autism, the youngest has schizophrenia. Almost five decades ago, coincidentally, she worked on committees that formulated some of the first federal legislation that ensconced laws protecting a right to free and appropriate education for all children. Lauren found herself back home in California at the time her youngest son was diagnosed with schizophrenia. The world changed for her. She had to search the streets and Delta for her son who spent many years homeless and fell into drug addiction. Her son has been conserved. Laura's advocacy now centers around housing that heals. And we'll hear more about that. So Alex and Lauren are each gonna speak for about 15 minutes or so. Then I will moderate a, a Q&A uh, with all of you and with our online audience. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming these experts, true experts uh, here to the matrix. Thank you so much for, for taking some time out of your, your day to, to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the Social Science Matrix for the invitation, and especially my past and perhaps uh, forever advisor, Marion Fourcade, uh, for, for organizing this event. Uh, it's really special to, to share the, the stage with, with Lauren, who was a really instrumental support early on in this project. Um, and as, as that kind introduction just noted, uh, perhaps I'm an expert, but I'm an expert only because of the hundreds of people who have shared their expertise and their experiences, and in many cases, their, their pain and their struggles with me. Um, so my work on this topic began when I was a PhD student here conducting a comparative study on decision making in public mental health in France and the US. And towards the end of my PhD, I began hearing about proposals across the Bay in San Francisco uh, to use conservatorship and ordinarily obscure medical legal intervention to address uh, some of the combination of uh, or, you know, urban, suffering, urban disorder, and addiction that I could see every day on my bike to campus. Uh, yet I quickly realized there was almost no academic research or government oversight into what was happening to people already on conservatorship. And so with an intrepid group of undergraduate research apprentices here at Berkeley, uh, we, we, we sought out to provide some of that analysis. My core argument in the book uh, is that as a result of what I call the state's abdication of authority, California's mental health system is producing both an excess of coercion that offers neither the social control that is being demanded by the public or politicians, nor the transformative care that some of the state's most vulnerable citizens ought to receive. Um, and concision is not my strong point. Karis Myrick recently described my book, not really as a book, but a tome. Um, but I will try and give, give you a, uh, a brief version of it uh, through telling one story, the story of Serge Obolensky, who I first interviewed in 2021 and I've had the, the pleasure of getting to know in the last few years. So you used to be able to search for No Hands Crazy on Ho and Hollywood on YouTube and find him. In one video that seems too Hollywood to be true, the camera person is focused on an LAPD officer who is laying out a spike trap in the road to put an end to a car chase in progress. And the video pans over to a man with no hands, a grizzled beard, and caked in dirty hair. He's shouting at the sky and clapping his two wrists together. These videos capture Serge's external behavior, but not his internal suffering. And when I interviewed him in 2021, he didn't give me a lot of details about his background, but says that he suffered an accident with a firecracker in his late teens. He lost both his hands and one eye. His parents were Scientologists and adamantly opposed to psychiatric treatment, even though he showed signs of developing psychosis. He was evicted from his apartment in 2001 and spent more than a decade homeless in Hollywood. So he describes it, it was very hard, very painful. I didn't have shoes, my hair was dirty, I was hungry all the time. I was freezing cold at night and I didn't have a blanket or anything. It was really bad. Serge was on the verge of becoming part of a shocking and shameful statistic, a massive rise of homeless mortality in the state that has grown much faster than the homeless population itself, uh, as you can see from the chart. Los Angeles went from 500 homeless deaths in 2014 to over 2,000 last year. While some of this is a consequence of the rise 
of new and lethal substances. It also reflects an aging unhoused population. The years and years that people like Serge have spent on the street accumulates into both increased vulnerability and increased skepticism of the health and social service interventions that are supposed to help them. So everyone who's lived in an urban area of California has seen Serge or someone like them and asked the question, why isn't somebody doing something to help him? Some people wonder why Serge wasn't being offered housing through programs like Housing First, while others ask, why is it that California's laws make it so hard to force someone like Serge into treatment? Yet Serge was not being left alone in some kind of homeless state of nature. In fact, one of the things that Serge remembers most clearly from that period is many, many 5150s. A 5150 refers to the part of California's Welfare and Institutions Code that allows a police officer or designated clinician to deem somebody a danger to self, danger to others, or gravely disabled, which means unable to meet their need for food, clothing, or shelter as a result of mental illness and transport them to an ER evaluation. 5150 is also the title of a Van Halen album and a Machine Gun Kelly song, now you know. Um, in Serge's case, the voices in his head would tell him to run into traffic and police would pick him up and take him to a hospital. Sometimes the voices would tell him to trespass and he'd be arrested instead. Serge's case speaks to a neglected truth. Well, we often hear that California's laws are particularly strict. Uh, if we look at the rate of these 72-hour holds, uh, California actually has a very high rate of short-term involuntary treatment. And if we look at 14-day commitment, somewhat longer 14-day commitments, California sits uh, you know, in the middle of many European countries. What Serge did not experience during his years on the street was a conservatorship. So conservatorship, also known as a guardianship, is a legal measure by which a third, judge grants a third party the power to place somebody in a facility, including a locked one, order them to receive treatment, and control their finances and personal decisions. Serge was always released by an ER within 48 hours. A clinician declared that Serge was meeting his need for food because people in the neighborhood would occasionally buy him a meal. He met his requirement for shelter because he knew to sleep in a doorway when it was raining. Sometimes, he'd, if he had been transported to a hos uh, hospital in another neighborhood, they'd even provide him a taxi back to Hollywood. A few times, he says the discharged social worker tried to hit a, hit, connect him to a shelter, but he didn't go. This outcome is not surprising. Despite the state's rate of, high rate of short-term involuntary interventions, the number of people receiving long-term interventions versus via a somewhat misleadingly named permanent conservatorship, which lasts one year, has gone down. Again, this isn't because civil rights laws, which have been largely the same since 1967, are getting stricter, nor is it because the treatment system is doing a better job of stabilizing and healing people. I think I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, this system that is you know, producing proliferating short-term involuntary interventions has extreme racial disparities built into it. So this is data that was put together by San Francisco. Uh, it's looking at the number of people in the city in fiscal year 2021 who had eight or more 5150s in one year. And you can see that in that population, 50% of the people subjected to that uh, were black or African American. San Francisco, as a reminder, is now 5% black. Kerry Morrison realized that there was another explanation for the mixture of abandonment and short and pointless coercion that Serge was facing. She was head of the Hollywood Business Improvement District, an organization that some scholars have roundly crit critiqued for advocating the criminalization of unsightly homeless individuals. But Morrison did much more than demand the police arrest or 5150 Surge. After all, Surge was already being regularly detained. What Morrison realized what there was that there was no accountability for ensuring that these detentions actually accomplished anything. She was getting at something akin to my conclusion in the book. Although California's landmark 1967 law, the Lanterman Petra Short Act, granted the state the power to adopt any rules, regulations, and standards as necessary to implement it, the state has largely abdicated that authority. It provides no guidelines as to the goal of the conservatorship system, nor best practices for how legal criteria like grave disability should be operationalized, nor serious oversight of the locked facilities where many conservatees wind up. The state's own power has been dispersed among a fragmented field of public and private actors that are using or opting not to use that power in keeping with their particular bureaucratic imperatives or funding constraints. As a result, you'll see getting someone care in California looks like, as one mom told me, the result of luck and heroics rather than a functioning system. In Serge's case, Carrie decided to step in. 
She concluded that Surge and others like him were missing an air traffic controller to, see, to ensure that they actually progressed through the system rather than simply cycled in and out of it. So she and a group of local nonprofits and charities mapped out on a whiteboard everything they knew about the Hollywood Top 14. The individuals in the neighborhood they identified as the most vulnerable and most likely to die if left on the streets. They were the ones who combined information from homelessness, law enforcement, and mental health agencies that ordinarily ignored one another. They assembled all this information into a dossier and hatched a plan. The group would wait for a day when a particularly sympathetic doctor was at call at the local hospital. During that physician's shift, the BIDS foot patrol would watch for surge to run into traffic and call LAPD. Meanwhile, someone from the Hollywood Top 14 team would camp out in the ER so that before surge was released by the ER, they would show the doctor the dossier and say, if you let him go, this has been the pattern and he's vulnerable. Everything worked like clockwork, she told me, and that did not make for a less tragic scene. She tells me the police had to handcuff him, but he doesn't have hands, so they used zip ties and he was kneeling on the ground. There's all sorts of law enforcement all around him. When Morrison talks about her work, she says, this is how we help people in America. Importantly, the team arranged for Surge to be taken to a county hospital, and this is an important point and offers a moment to talk about a theme that politicians like Gavin Newsom have really hammered on in recent months, which is California's desperate lack of treatment beds. My research documents a war zone-like triaging of scarce beds by which families, clinicians, and first responders scramble to get extremely sick people into facilities. I once watched a discharged social worker plead for a miracle that would convince a hospital to keep a homeless pregnant woman with schizophrenia one night. Given this, it might surprise you that from a comparative perspective, California is not noticeably under-equipped if we look at all locked mental health facilities in the state. California sits between Australia and Denmark with more than the UK, Canada, or Sweden. What creates this shortfall is first California's immense need. The combination of the nation's highest real poverty rate, half the county's unsheltered homeless, waves of austerity in the mental health system, and not just under Ronald Reagan, and mass incarceration have created vulnerable people like Surge who essentially do not exist in many European countries. Moreover, California's locked beds are used badly. California has the fourth largest state-run hospital system by capita, but most of those beds are used for people found incompetent to stand trial, treated just enough so they can be judged and punished. And as a harrowing recent report by Disability Rights California found, many people in locked facilities in the state linger there for months or years after being cleared for discharge because the private residential treatment providers the state relies on won't take people with comorbid medical needs, substance abuse challenges, or history of violence. Most of California's acute care psychiatric hospitals are privately run and for profit. As you can see from the yellow bars, half of the state's beds authorized to take involuntary patients are in such facilities. But private facilities are not engaged in any project of Foucauldian social control. Instead, they keep people as long as insurance is paying and discharge them when it stops. In LA, private hospitals have an astonishing readmission rate of 37% within 30 days. Surge, however, was brought to a county hospital. Public facilities like these are more willing to eat the costs of holding somebody for a long period while waiting for a conservatorship. And you can see that in the brown bars on the right, showing the proportion of conservatorship referrals from, coming from different types of facilities. This does not say anything about the quality of care being offered. So in Serge's case, the dossier passed through an ER up to the inpatient unit, where after waiting a requisite 17 days, the doctor applied for a conservatorship. That dossier was then evaluated by a county agency, the public guardian, and referred for a hearing. Now, in theory, conservatorship hearings are a point where law and medicine, where rights and care collide, a delicate balancing act. But Serge doesn't remember his public defender fighting for him or even that he spoke to the judge. He just remembers the doctor testified that he couldn't take care of himself and it made him upset. Serge was placed on a conservatorship. So what does it mean to be conserved? Popular culture, like the Netflix movie I Care A Lot and Britney Spears' case, have painted a picture of a guardianship industry riven with active exploitation. But people with mental illness rarely have the kind of assets that would attract an unscrupulous private conservator. Surge was thus the charge of an obscure county agency, the Public Guardian. Depictions of Public Guardians also emphasize, as one 1972 profile put it, that they have total power to decide when they'll see the sunshine again. In practice, though, public guardians have caseloads that range from 60 to 100 people and a limited budget, budget consisting primarily of their ward social security checks. Far from having overbearing parents, conservatees often seem like latchkey kids. 
One public guardian reflecting on the public's increased desire to see more people conserved lamented to me, they think it's a magic wand. Oh, let's get them conserved and then everything will be solved. But we only have two powers, placement and medication, and we have no placement budget. So in Serge's case, the court, or court ordered the public guardian to place Serge in a long-term care facility. But hospitals and guardians have little leverage over these facilities whose beds are scarce and for which counties have to compete. So Serge was stuck for months on inpatient until one day Carrie went to visit him and he was gone. The, Carrie the hospital wouldn't tell Carrie where he was, citing privacy laws. Carrie raged. Our system does not want to even acknowledge that there might be someone out there who cares, who might be the lifeline, the connector, could provide people with five bucks or whatever. When we were speaking with Carrie and Serge, Carrie reflected, if we did not go looking for you, nobody in the world would have known where you were. You would have been completely alone. Carrie eventually tracked Serge to a locked facility on the outskirts of LA. These mental health re rehabilitation centers, MHRCs, are inauspicious places. At the facility I visited, which is not the one pictured, you have to look carefully at the vine-covered fence around an exercise area out back to realize that it's topped with barbed wire. The facility was eerily quiet. It has no staff psychiatrist. It contrasts contracts for physicians to meet each resident once every two weeks. There are no licensed psychologists providing one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy. Most of the activities are groups on anger management or living skills put on by program counselors who the manager told me were uncertified people who would otherwise be working at McDonald's. While I was touring, a woman came up to me to show me poetry she was writing with, with titles like Locked In and My Incarceration. At that moment, I felt like crying. I had been hearing about the desperate need for more MHRC beds and seeing that need. But when I finally saw them, I realized we were clamoring for people to shuffle empty hallways in silence for months or years waiting for the next antipsychotic in injection. But Kristen, a nurse from the local public health department who joined on the tour, saw things differently. She runs a county independent supported housing first program and talks about a client who's refusing to be in a higher level of care, even though they recently found him in a bathroom, almost in a coma, defecating on himself with near fatal blood sugar. It's so great for, to see people cared for, Kristen said, also fighting back tears. For some people, an MHRC is just better and safer. And when it comes to whether you see conservatorship as abuse or compassion, your reference point matters a lot. In Serge's case, Carrie and her compatriot eventually found a contact in the Department of Mental Health who had stretched privacy laws to tell them where Serge had wound up. Carrie drove to the far reaches of LA to meet him and made a distressing discovery. Although Serge had been conserved for months, he had not actually met his public guardian. Concretely, that means he wasn't having any of his social security check transferred to him, so he couldn't even get food from the MHRC's small snack bar. Carrie raised what she called holy hell with the county, and within a day or two, Serge's public guardian reached out. Serge, was, um, Serge himself was surprisingly lacking in antipathy towards those who treated him. He expressed his gratitude for the unlocked about board and care home he stepped down into, a setting that provides 24-hour supervision and help with medication management. However, these facilities are evaporating statewide uh, as a result of rising property values, increasing labor costs, and again, decades of state indifference. Lauren has visited many of these facilities, and she's really the person to ask about what makes a good or a bad board and care. In any case, when we spoke, Serge enthusiastically told me about working on his GAD and the new prosthetics he was getting through the Aftermath Foundation, which helps people who have fled Scientology. He was also in the process of dropping to a lower level of care. When Serge came off conservatorship, he was given a full-service partnership, California's highest level of voluntary services, which would visit him multiple times in his board and care. But in California, no level of care is supposed to be permanent, and in the future, he'll have to get to the clinic himself. That's him getting his GAD. So Serge is a striking success story, but did conservatorship have to be part of it? Carrie told me that for many of the people in the Hollywood top 14, by the time her team engaged, there was nothing left between death and conservatorship. Serge himself was conflicted. Towards the end of our interview, I asked him what I, th what I think the question we should all be asking. Is there anything that you could have offered you in those years that would have, you would have accepted to get you into housing or treatment? He said, I would have accepted both, but no one ever offered. I said, if somebody's going to give you an apartment, a, ho a hotel room, would you have said yes? Definitely. What would you have said if a psychiatrist visited you and offered to renew your prescription? That would have been good. Opponents of expanding conservatorship see these kinds of narratives and the evidence that many people in California requesting housing, drug treatment, or mental health services don't get them as evidence that the crisis on California streets could be addressed without expanding forced treatment. 
Instead, we need to engage people with persistent offers of the things they want, which for some people, what drew them into treatment was a promise to get them an ID or a trip to the dentist. And by relying on peers with lived experience to make the connection rather than just traditional clinicians. Yet at a different point in our interview, Serge gave me a different answer. He told me that in the throes of psychosis, he didn't necessarily want treatment. As I asked, you've had a lot of experience with the mental health system. If you were in charge and you could change one thing, what would you change first? And he said that they conserved me earlier. So you would, ha you would have them conserve you earlier? Yeah, even though you didn't want it. He said, if I got off the street earlier, that would have been better. Serge's ambivalence was common in my interviews with dozens of people who had received forced treatment in California. While some people described what they had experienced unequivocally as torture, others perceived it as a difficult, but at a certain moment in their life, necessary intervention. I am reaching the end here, but the, the idea that there are people who need mental health treatment, but who, due to traumatic past interactions, bad experiences with medication, or due to the symptoms of their illnesses themselves, cannot accept it, has driven three major pieces of reform that I want to briefly review as I close out my presentation. The first are care courts passed in 2022. These are civil courts that can order people to follow a treatment or housing plan and obligate counties to provide it. These courts don't have a strong enforcement mechanism, but they can refer a person to conservatorship. Conservatorships themselves are going to get easier to get. SB 43 passed in 2023 changed conservatorship criteria to add substance use disorders and include medical care and personal safety alongside food, clothing, and shelter. Currently, 56 of 58 counties in the state have delayed implementation of the law, citing capacity limitations. Which is why Prop 1, which continues to hang in the balance, we actually don't know if it's going to pass, uh, you know, which promises $6.4 billion for new beds, some of which can be in locked facilities, is likely to be so impactful. My own research suggests that the definition of grave disability expands or contracts based on available beds. So I think this may be the most significant of these reforms. I'm currently uh, finishing or starting moving towards publishing some current research uh, that shows that these reforms put California at the leading edge of a national trend. Citing concerns about homelessness, mass incarceration, gun violence, and youth mental health, states nationwide have introduced 1,600 bills in the last decade related to involuntary treatment, which with a group of assistants at NYU we've been cataloging. Democratic states like California, Oregon, and Hawaii are at the forefront. Whether these reforms are a pendulum swing towards the battle days of mass institutionalization or course correction towards a more balanced mental health system depends enormously on implementation. And this is why I think there's value in California taking seriously a rigorous evaluation component and being ready to shift its approach depending on the results. So for, I'll, I'll close with five concluding thoughts, all of which reflect my own somewhat conflicted conclusions in a book where conservatorship really was at one moment a form of abuse, at other moments, a life-saving tool, and in some cases, like surges, perhaps a bit of both. The first is that California state government has abdicated authority over the conservatorship system. Conservatorship is an immensely powerful government tool, but government doesn't actually determine how it gets used. The consequence is that people like Surge experience both repeated short-term coercion and abandonment, sometimes within 48 hours. My second conclusion is that while there is an absolutely an enormous need for more voluntary treatment and housing in the state, I've also found that for a subset of people, these will not meet their current needs. Every Housing First provider intensive outpatient program or peer support outreach team I've observed has emphasized that they have many clients who need but cannot get into a higher level of care. For this reason, I wrote at the end of my book that I thought a accountable, careful, targeted use of conservatorship could help some of these individuals. But as time goes on, I am more and more doubtful about whether the state could actually consistently provide this. Fourth, my interviews with service users highlights the extent to which our focus on access to beds and care has often come at the expense of discussing what actually happens to people in those beds, why some people are afraid of sleeping in those beds, and concerns about quality more broadly. Finally, I recognize that my ability to call for nuance and compromise reflects the privilege of an academic able to take a step, step, step back and claim some difference, distance from this issue. Still, I think the near failure of Prop 1 uh, is an interesting caution. The large no vote reflects a surprisingly effective campaign from advocates for voluntary treatment. But I think it also reflects a growing backlash against any spending on homelessness and mental health. Historically, the biggest divide is not between those who are for and against involuntary treatment between families and service users, but between those who believe we have some collective responsibility 
for addressing these issues versus those who embrace a kind of nihilism about whether anything can and should be done. The time to do our best to combine our various expertises and approaches to show that, this, that we really can do better is now. On that note, I'll express my intense gratitude and look forward to hearing from, from Lauren. Thanks for hanging in that slightly longer than promised presentation. Thank you so much, Alex. We will bring Lauren up to the podium and I guess maybe move the slides. First off, Alex, thank you for inviting me to present with you. I think your book was amazing. And um, I think many families like mine feel that it is something that needed to be done. And we really thank you for the research. Um, this is a picture of me and my cohorts. And I want to thank everyone here in the room and many of you who are online. Um, if you look at this, way, well over on the left, you'll see Rose King. Rose King actually was one of the people that penned the Mental Health Services Act along with Daryl and Rusty Celix. She was the person who really moved it. She was the head of the Democratic Party at the time, and she moved forward. And next to her is my, my dear friend and the person I toured California with, Teresa Pasquini. And I'm in the middle there before I went gray. <laughs> so hello to everyone. I am one of the many moms on a mission to help those with a serious mental illness and substance use disorder. Those forgotten and disposed of, the discarded accumulating on our city streets, and also the forgotten, those in their community, but living stunted existence in their loved ones' back rooms. So this is the slide all of you have seen. While it, while it is so important to me is that actually in 1974, I actually left the state of California because my oldest son at that time was diagnosed with uh, childhood schizophrenia because in the DSM-3, there wasn't yet the um, autism designation. And he was going to be placed at the Agnew State School because I kept hammering away. All, everything I know, everything I read, you've got to start working with him when he's two, when he's three. They said he could, they could take him when he was four, but he would have to go to the Agnew State School. My husband and I became panicked. Um, I, had, I was a researcher, um, and I found a school district in Texas, the Cypress Fairbank School District, and that's where I met a lot of other moms like me, and we really that what that school system had that California didn't had was an early childhood education program. And my son, who everyone wanted to put at Agnew State School, today is a janitor at Dreger's, a really nice supermarket. He's been working. He's not on, he's not on SSI. He's not on SSDI. He's completely a great human being who drives a car but prefers to live with his family. We're one of those old Italian families where if you don't get married, you live with your family forever. <laughs> now, this um, uh, is a slide I um, asked permission from the Public Policy Institute of California to show. And this gives us um, an idea of exactly what is happening to people uh, like, my, uh, like many of our loved ones who end up just not on the street but actually in jail. And um, this is one of the saddest things that is happening. This is why I really became involved. I can't live with the status quo. I can't live with when my son goes off of his medication and he will at some time, hopefully maybe, maybe there'll be a miracle and he won't this time. But then I have to search, and I many times find him in the Delta of California, involved in the meth trade in what they call Meth Island, which is Bethel Island. Um, many times he'll be on the street. And when Teresa and I were uh, on our first tour right in our own county, this is why it's all grainy and not so great, is this is what we, we were up against. So. The status quo has failed to help the most seriously and persistently mentally ill and addicted. 
These are the people who are suffering from psychosis that prevents them from receiving the medical care and psychiatric care they need. People who are not just in danger, but whose psychosis will bring great harm to them or someone else. I accepted the invitation to speak with Alex today to describe to you what LPS conservatorship means to families like mine. There are the A words. They are paramount in any discussion about conservatorship. The first, anastignosia. The false conviction within a person that nothing is wrong with their mind. It stems from the physiological byproduct of psychosis and accompanies about 50% of schizophrenia occurrences and 40% of bipolar cases. The second is the A word, appropriate. I worked in at the federal government level in the 1984, and one of the things that we had our longest discussion on was the use of the word appropriate in a free and public education, that it had to be appropriate. And I think that this is, this is paramount to our understanding because, as you mentioned, it's not necessarily the laws. It's the implementation of the laws. It's the implementation of what happens. Appropriate like anastignosia is essential when decisions are made regarding treatment and placement. We hear so often about least restrictive environment, but too often appropriate has been dropped. This word appears in state and federal legislation and is essential. It was placed there to assure that in all placements, what is done will bring benefit and prevent harm. We want our loved ones' civil rights protected through a due process hearing. We want the conservatorship to come up for renewal every year. We want a person who is conserved to have a placement review hearing if they disagree with their placement. We want the structure of the LPS conservatorship to be there to prevent further harm for the person to be given the opportunity to live as full a life as possible. And a conservatorship does that. All those things I mentioned, it does that today. In California, Senate Bill 43, the new LPS conservatorship statute, when finally enacted in every county in California, will give us the opportunity to see if medical intervention can enable people with a severe and persistent mental illness or addiction to recover in the appropriate, least restrictive setting. Senate Bill 43 changes the definition of grave disability in two ways. It clearly states severe substance use disorder as a reason someone can be considered uh, for conservatorship. And why personally this is important to me was, believe it or not, when someone has been in the system for a long time, their records get lost. Um, I happen to be a pretty faithful researcher and representative record keepers, so I kept mine. But I thought it was amazing when my son's conservator told me that my son, he felt, really didn't have that much of a mental illness, but what he had was a substance use disorder. Of course he had a substance use disorder. He was a meth addict. But everyone had forgotten that since he was 17 and a half, and now he was in his 40s, that he had schizophrenia. This gets forgotten. And what we can't do is we can't, we can't sit there and argue which came first, the chicken or the egg. They're both very, very severe medical situations that need to be looked at. Um, the other is, and most importantly, what this new um, LPS conservatorship statute does, it, it adds a person's inability to provide for one's personal safety or necessary medical care to the old statute that was only concerned with, the per, with a person's inability to provide food, clothing, and shelter as reasons for a person to be held on a conservatorship. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Agency, SAMHSA, the federal entity that gives guidance to the state mental health systems, describes recovery as this, a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. A real life situation, though, is not addressed in this definition. 
is what happens when a person is suffering from psychosis with a delusional thought process and has lost touch with reality. Conservatorship addresses this. It provides a structure needed so that lives may be stabilized and a person has a chance at recovery. I logged many miles touring the state with Teresa Pasquini. Our mission was to find housing models that could be replicated that ended the human log jam that sent people back to the street and locked doors where many fell into addiction and zombie-like existences. We visited many types of living environments, included the mental health rehabilitation centers and adult residential facilities. Now I'm going to go through and show you some. This is the best of the best of the um, Institutes of Mental Disease, uh, or as we call them in California, the Mental Health Rehabilitation Centers. This is in the Central Valley of California. It is, it is uh, not a nonprofit. I don't think that the family that owns it are making huge amounts of money. They're a family of psychiatrists, and this is the gold standard in the state. Teresa and I have been to many, and this is what we need to have. This is why we don't have as many as that, because the counties or the insurance companies now have to pay $450 to $500 a day average. But what if we did that? What if we actually took, the, took that amount of money? I think we, we may, not for all, but for many, stop that revolving door. Um, this is Everwell's Behavioral Health. Now, this is a for-profit, not locked. But what is um, amazing about Everwell Behavioral Health is they don't, they cherry pick the people who came to them uh, the least. Uh, remember, there's a shortage of beds. So um, er everyone who uh, is vying for and I, I don't like to call them beds, but placements within a facility. Uh, they can say, no, we don't want that person. They've got diabetes. It looks like they might be losing a limb because of gangrene. They might have a colostomy bad. We can't take them. Or they may be coming out of Napa State Hospital or another state hospital. But oh, look what put them in there. They have also, um, they might have. Uh, be a pedophile or something like that, been diagnosed as being a pedophile. So Everwell will take everyone, will take people before most other places will. Uh, this is one of their facilities. It's out in um, the Stockton area. Uh, one of their chief things that they really want to do is they want to give people real food. That they don't have a psychiatrist and a psychologist on staff like CPT does. That's the one good thing about CPT. They do have uh, people with master level clinician status there. But now this is the gold standard uh, when we travel the state for facilities that contract with the counties. That means these are people that aren't on private insurance. They are, and almost everyone after many years on the street or many years having a severe mental illness or substance use disorder is going to be using the county behavioral health system. Synergy contracts with our uh, county behavioral health systems. 95% um, of the residents are, as you can see, on Medi-Cal, Medicare, or uh, Veteran Affairs. Um, there are facilities, there's um, one in Morgan Hill, there's one south of Morgan Hill, and now they have a group of them that are opening up in Stockton. They, almost everyone there is conserved. So you don't have to be in a locked facility. You can be in an unlocked facility. This is, um, when I showed you the other three previous ones I showed you were classified as for-profit, okay? One of the reasons they were classified as for-profit is until just recently, in order to build a facility or in order to enhance a facility, you had to go get a loan from a bank. It's very hard to get a loan from the bank 
if you're a nonprofit. A for-profit, a different story. So that's why many of the people and the places that you see caring for those with a serious mental illness, they are for-profits. This one is not. It is a nonprofit. The problem for me, not for the problem for the people that are there, it was amazing. We spent two days there looking at this place. They um, keep their residential program only to those with a schizophrenic spectrum disorder, but look at the cost. Look at what they managed to do. They, um, um, they're charging families about $40,000 a year. Of course, they have other foundation money that is keeping them alive and well. And these figures are 2019. I haven't checked in with them, but um, this, this shows you um, what can happen. It's cheaper to care for people in a facility like this. And what they did in Santa Ana was they bought this block that was falling apart, this cul-de-sac that was falling apart. They purchased all, the, they purchased three homes at the top of it and then worked with the other two families uh, and offered them a lot of, a really good price to move out. And they took over a cul-de-sac in Santa Ana. Now Santa Ana is in Orange County, but it's not your wealthiest part of it. Orange County. So it, it, it's a good place. People, they've got, they're on the bus route. They can go to community college. There's a lot that can happen there. Um, they have a few people who are conserved, but not, not everyone. Okay, so um, to prevent homelessness and the endless cycle from street to jail to the emergency room, we need to move from scarcity to abundance. And we don't have what I showed you. There's just not enough of, of those. We, um, when someone is seriously mentally ill or addicted and is discharged from an emergency room, we must ask, discharge to where? Back to the street is not appropriate. It is wrong. Appropriate is the key to providing the correct care. The setting must bring benefit and not cause further harm. Too many people are sent back to unsupported living situations, often left on the street to die 20 to, 20 to 30 years before they should. That's a fact with schizophrenia. It is a fact also that most large counties find their jails are their largest behavioral health treatment facilities. And then there are the open air asylums found in our urban areas and encampments along our byways and rivers where those suffering from untreated mental illness and addiction live and are preyed upon. And if you've been to downtown Los Angeles, I know that um, Alex spent some time with my friend Susan Partovi. She ministers and works, brings her medical ability to those that are in the open air asylum of downtown Los Angeles. Um, we the people of California still have promises to keep. The promise we made when we closed the state hospitals and we would provide treatment and care for the most severely ill in their communities. We abdicated our authority. It was and is our responsibility to call on state legislators to provide adequate funding. Instead, we passed on the authority first to the state, who passed it on to the counties, but we the people never funded a system of care that we promised. Not all people can recover to the point where they will need a room key and the av availability of supports and services. This is housing first, and it works for a lot of people. It's not a bad thing. It's a really good thing, but not for all. Prevention, early intervention, and peer supports are essential. But let us not forget those who need more, those who need intensive psychiatric support, those who need to see a psychiatrist, psychologist, or master level clinician very frequently to assure correct treatment is given so that they are not living in a world filled with psychotic delusions. This is housing that heals. Our robust group home industry developed for those with an intellectual disability because a sufficient amount of funding followed those who need intensive care within the community. As you can see from the bottom arrow over there, 
if you um, have an intense intellectual developmental disability and you're in a facility that has more than five beds, um, the state's getting close to $12,000. Um, the state is giving $12,000 a month for their care. For those with a serious mental illness, so it's about a thousand. And the reason it's a thousand is they back out the Medi-Cal and Medicare portion, which is about three hundred dollars, and then that leaves the um, that leaves leaves with less than a thousand. Also, all all good board and cares will also keep back and give their their person some money. So. Um, when my son has been in situations like this, uh, the facility is probably getting about $750 or $800 a month. Um, in our tour of the state, we observed that both for-profit and nonprofit entities can build and provide care within the community. I know that LPS conservatorship sa saves lives. I have also seen it fail because conservators sometimes do not understand the intensity of the illness that, um, and they want to treat the person in a setting that is not structured enough. There, um, too many of our loved ones have left housing placements that are not appropriate and ended up enslaved in the underbelly of the drug world or worse, dead. This is Allison Monroe, she's a dear friend of mine. This is her daughter, Diana, who, who passed. She left a board and care, which really wasn't a high enough. It's, um, conservators have a great responsibility. And when people are not put in a, in a place where they get enough support and structure, they wander off and they end up like Diana de does. And um, that that was dead from an overdose of fentanyl. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your patience. Thank you so much, Lauren. And our audience here has been terrific. So I think we have time for questions and as well as for online. So I'm going to invite my real experts to have a seat so that they can field these questions. And we'll, should we go back and forth between the room and the virtual world? Do we, do we have a couple in the room? We could do two at a time, perhaps. You guys are all right with that? Yeah. If there is demand. Give people a moment to not feel the Goffmanian stigma of raising their hands. <laughs> Do we have something online we could start with? Wait, there we go. Richard. I just wondered if uh, either or both of you has anything to suggest about the strategy that California should pursue for the next year or five or ten. It's uh, excellent. Was there another? I mean, we want to add on to that. Can you say it again, please? Do you mind repeating the question? I think it was what What's the best course California should take in the next one to five years in this in this area? Um, please. Yeah. Just until you get the mic. Thanks. Uh, can you talk about the process of the uh, competing for beds between different counties? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. The competition between counties for, for beds. And I do think, I mean, that's sort of like, what should we do in the next five years is really, I mean, it's, the, the, it's a great question, but it's also such a vast question. So maybe I'll just target um, thinking about, again, we have this huge discussion about beds. We need beds, beds, beds. And I think we need to have a much more careful discussion of like a bed is a mattress, right? So, and you can build a bed in a congregate homeless shelter and you can build a bed in a state hospital that is highly secured and you've built two beds, but that's really, really different. And so I think a couple of things I talk about in the book, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the need for more kind of, I mean, the need for more housing is like, that's our baseline, but the need for more sort of residential treatment settings I think when you, on the ground, you really, really see it. But does it need to go into building more locked settings? I think one thing we could start by saying is that many locked settings have many people who are have been deemed appropriate for discharge. Like, like by any standard, the people are not supposed to be there. Um, but for a lack of step-down providers, sort of therapeutic, unlocked settings, people are stuck in these, these placements. And so I think really trying to figure out what is the thing we need between these locked settings 
in between people being able to survive on the, in supported housing, like what is the process, the kind of skills people need? I think that sort of missing middle of the continuum is probably where I would invest the most. But I do think it's maybe not just about for-profit or unprofit. I, nonprofit, I think you've really helped me challenge my sociological biases against anything for-profit on that. But I do think we have a system in which counties are currently bidding against each other to get access to these scarce beds, which has all sorts of, I mean, it, it increases costs. It gives a huge amount of leverage to these facilities to decide who they're going to take or not take. Um, and it has these super tragic consequences in terms of people being scattered around the state because I talked to one county that had a hundred bed MHRC in the county, but they could only afford, they had only won the contract for six of those beds and they were actually losing that contract to another bigger county. So all of their conservatees were going to be sent out of county even though they had a facility in the county. And I talked to county mental health directors who were very honest of like, we're just buying up you know, we're going to the neighboring county and we're buying this up. And when I talk to people in the state, they're like, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Counties shouldn't be doing that. It's like, yeah, if only there was some layer of government above counties that could. So, so I think there's a, you know, like, so, so I think there's a huge amount of, there, there, there's a lot of opportunity in terms of smart investment to use the kind of beds that are available better. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a need for a much more rational system. One psychiatrist described getting into these facilities as a beauty contest where you sort of misrepresent and lie about somebody's needs in a way that, you know, will make, make it so they won't get ruled out. I mean, it's, so I, I think I've lost a little bit the thread of this response, but I, I think there's a lot of space for uh, sorting out the residential treatment system in which I think a more engaged state government could be incredibly helpful. Lauren, do you have yeah. a take on that? Yeah. Uh, could you move it back one? <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, oh. uh, there we go. have a real expert. So, um, I've been on both sides of the aisle, on the IDD community and the seriously mentally ill community. And the one reason why things aren't getting built and the one thing, and because you can build it, but if you don't have the money to actually provide the treatment and care, what we're going to end up with is like a picture I saw in San Diego that broke my heart, and that was um, in getting ready for the CARE Act that they were going to have this bridge housing. And what the bridge housing was, was basically looking like the worst prison inside of a prison they had beds stacked three high uh six across you know three across a uh, aisle and three across that people are not going to stay you you can't people who are ill need to be in an environment where they can get well and that will cost some money and we do ha we did as a state out of our gen see this general fund pays for those with an intellectual developmental disability. We on the severe mental illness side, it's realignment one and realignment two and MHSA and leveraging all those dollars so we can pull down federal support dollars from our federal federal dollars. So this is where we as at California are having a problem. Maybe Cal AIM, hopefully Cal AIM will open up and cause more money to flow into places like I showed you, like Synergy and Everwell, so that um, money will be there so that they can actually expand their services. They're not about to go out and to build new facilities unless they know that the money to pay their clinicians, their psychiatrists, and their psychologists are going to follow them. Now, Synergy has a great model. And it is, and that is they have what is called a certified mental health clinic right next door to their facility. Because our California law does not allow them to be at the same address. So they're actually, um, 
they're wise about it. So they, they ha are able to bill, bill because they have a facility with 90 people in it. They have a full-time psychiatrist, two full-time psychologists, and masters in social work there, and they have broken the code, all right? Other places like Everwell um, do it a little bit differently, but they do need more than $45 a day. We've got to be realistic. And that is what, even with patches, each county, if they use their MHSA money wisely and they use their real, um, they can actually uh, bring down some federal dollars and they can pay for better care at the better, at the better facilities. But no one is going to build these facilities until we actually get real about what it costs to get someone well. Can I ask a follow-up on this? Because I'm really struck by this chart, uh, Lauren. Thank you so much for sharing. And I would love to get both of your thoughts on this. I mean, what account, A, what accounts for this huge disparity in treatment between intellectual disability and mental illness? Like we're taking one group of people and we're giving them at least something approximating what they need and we're taking another group and essentially not even coming close to it in a way that guarantees both their suffering and our own confusion as to who's responsible for it so what would it take to bring this top number down to this much more adequate amount is that a federal piece of legislation is it a yeah. new state law and why haven't we had it combination of both yeah <laughs> i mean i think it's so striking that frank lanterman was the sponsor of both the Lanterman Petra Short Act and the Lanterman, uh, it was called the, Reto it was now the Lanterman yeah. De Developmental Disabilities Act. And they really did set up two very, you know, the, two very different kinds of systems that the, you know, the mental health system was set up as there are these grants to counties, but counties can use them how they want. And in the end, the counties really didn't serve the population of people coming out of the state hospitals. And the commitment with the Lanterman, the Lanterman Act for people with de developmental disabilities was an set up as an entitlement program that the funds would match, you know, the, the need automatically as opposed to the mental health system where it's still written in the law that services will be provided to the extent resources are available. And so there's a very different architecture and a very different kind of commitment that was made very early on. I would love to dig in to understand that, but I do think there's, there are some researchers that have looked at, I mean, the different sort of discourses around deinstitutionalization and how people were represented um, and, you know, the extent to which there was an incredible amount of stigma, but also this idea that if you take people with mental illness out of the mental health system and you just put them in the community with these new magic medications, they're going to be productive citizens and everything is going to be fine versus a kind of a very paternalistic you know, discourse around people with developmental disabilities that is often there was presented as they're the forever children that we have this obligation to. So we can find problems in both processes, but I do think it's significant that no one is saying we need to reinstitutionalize people with developmental disabilities. So I think it suggests that the idea of deinstitutionalization you know, there's not there. There was a there was a failure in its implementation, particularly for people with with mental illness. But that's not, you know, clearly this is a process that could have gone much better if the kind of commitment that was made. And if you dig into the developmental disability system, you immediately find tons of problems. You know, I've done I've done some interviewing about it because within the mental health space, we hear like, oh, it's so much better over there. So I wanted to go see if that was true, and. You hear about all these problems, but at the end of that interview, is someone says, "But thank goodness we're not the mental health system. That you know this system it does work better." And I think it's it's really tied to this idea that there's an entitlement. They're going to evaluate a person, and after that, the state has the responsibility for contracting with the for the services that were evaluated as necessary. And it's not, you know, it's not you know constrained funding wise in the same way. Yeah. I agree with everything you said, but I think we also have to be realistic in that in, in the 70s and 80s, when the funding streams were being developed, people with a mental illness were seen as having bad behavior. And people with an uh, intellectual dis developmental disability, people knew something is really wrong with them. They're behaving 
their behavior is not like everyone else's and they may need help because their brain doesn't their brain and central nervous system and their with their gut system it, it is it is not working properly we didn't see that i think and and when we did uh, that not people in this room probably did but there's a large swath of the population that didn't they thought it was bad behavior and that if uh, if it was an illness that if we just gave them the medication they're going to get better well guess what not everyone with schizophrenia with bipolar gets better. A lot of people do, and that is wonderful. And I work diligently with brain and behavior and the researchers out there. We've got to keep going. It's going to get better. But not everyone gets better on psychi uh, psych psychiatric medication. And um, I think we thought we didn't know what was what was going. Also, um, board and cares work really well. You know, if you have like 12 people or six people in a home, for those with an I IDD, when you get people who have schizophrenia and they have been taking their medication for a while and everything, they want a, they want a community. They don't want it. In board and cares, there's so much regulation. They can't cook. You can't make your own meal. You, you can't do your own laundry. You can't even have a garden in your backyard, in the backyard. So we need a different way of doing it. We need places where they have a community too within a community so that, much like a college campus, we, we need that, but not big, huge institutions. No one wants to go back to having 1,000, 2,000 people at, in, in a state hospital. That's awful, and I'm glad it stopped. Thank you so much, Lauren. Do we have some folks online? Um, Otherwise, yeah, we, we have a lot of questions online. So um, I'll just, I'm going to read a couple of them. Uh, so one from Martina Satris, who says, the determination of who is incompetent to control their own lives, money, and living places historically aligns with those not valued by society. Native Americans are an example within California history. And um, she references the Palm Springs checkerboard for Agua Caliente and the guardianship system that was used, um, I think, during the 60s. Um, with a broadening loosening of conservatorship, how do we sh ensure against cultural bias informing who is determined to not be mentally competent? And then um, I'll highlight one other question um, from Kari. Um, who says that she's grateful to hear these stories and wants to honor Diana and the many of people who have lost their lives as a result of the country and state's unwillingness to adequately fund truly holistic, life-affirming care and support for folks and their families. Um, I'm wondering about the potential for more expansive support for families, communities that care for their loved ones with SMI, what do Lauren and Alex think about creating more funding for care teams of psychiatrists, social workers, occupational therapists, et cetera, who could provide wraparound support for families, caregivers, while keeping their loved ones in the home? So why don't we tackle those two, and then I think we'll have time to come back for a couple more from the room. Yeah, I, I think the, I mean, racial disparity and sort of historical disparities in who's deemed incompetent is, is something that looms over my you know, something that I think looms over all of this in the sense that, um, again, I, I think that there are situations that I encountered in my research where it felt like conservatorship was the only option. And that's what led me to this conclusion of, well, could we have an accountable conservatorship system, a well-regulated conservatorship system, you know, a, a you know, a carefully evaluated conservatorship system. But it is true that if we, you know, kick the tires on any part of the mental health system and look at who's, who's facing more mechanical restraints in ERs, who's more likely to have involuntary medication, who's more likely to, in the most recent Disability Rights California report, who's more likely to be stuck in jail even though they no longer even, they like legally can't even be in jail, but they're waiting for step-down placement. It's like the, it's always people of color. And, and the fact that it is, we have not, there's no place where we don't find that to me is is like you know it's it, it it is the the thing that makes me you know certainly makes me wonder about what i that this vision of you could have this accountable conservatorship system 
it's just we we've that hasn't been created anywhere that you know they haven't there's no place where we don't see those racial disparities and i feel like that's a that's a you know something that i that is we have to sit with and and think about for sure i think this question about support for families is so core um and i think this i i, I think that was also raised in terms of the the professional. We have a huge workforce crisis in California, and I think that's why it was interesting they mentioned, I don't remember the exact list, but we need to be thinking about other sets of professionals to be involved in this, occupational therapists, peer supporters, psychiatric nurse practitioners, and bringing in a broader set of expertise. But I think certainly, you know, one of the ways, one of the consequences of the state's abdication of responsibility in this space is just the assumption that families will pick up the slack um, and I think that that is, uh, has been deep, deeply unfair um, to, across the board. And I think there's a huge amount of responsibility for, for creating better supports for, for families. Lauren, do you want to comment on that? Or? Well, um, my experience and the experience of many of the hundreds of advocates, and I do get uh, well, probably about 100 calls a year, is that when someone is so ill that they will qualify for a conservatorship, staying in their family home at that point probably is not the answer. Maybe it will become the answer, but it isn't the answer at that time. The other thing that I think that Alex shows in his book that I think was really good is that our public guardian system is in chaos. It really doesn't exist. It's not even a state, but Public Guardian's Office is a nonprofit institution. In my own county, the conservatorship office is in dece it's in deceitful. It's it's just it's not there. That when we are our, our guardian our public guardians for those with a serious mental illness and our conservatorship programs are different in every single county. Yeah. There and they are drastically underfunded in my county. I'm sure that in your counties they are too. But I actually know the dollars and cents that are in my county, and I can say this is tragic. We have to build a system and we have to make sure that our public guardian offices are financed. Let's take one or two more and then we'll give a final word. So, how about? You and you over here. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for for talking about this subject. Um, I have a lot of questions. How do I boil it down? I'm really interested in this slide and the conversation about different disabilities. Um, it was actually something um, that I was thinking about in reading the book and wanted to ask Alex in the, the conversation at the very beginning about language. Um, when you were talking about the different ways to talk about mental health, that you didn't include mental health disability. And so I was mm. curious about that. And and this, I think, just I was kind of alarmed a little bit. There's so much um, within disability community and just marginalized communities in general of kind of pitting groups against each other, right? And so how can we kind of learn from each other without saying, well, they have it better than we do, um, which I know is not what you were intending to say, but I think it's easy for people to go there. Um, and, I, you know, it's a, a really interesting question for me about how do we kind of, um, how do we learn from different disability models and see what's out there? And how do we allow people with mental health issues to connect and learn from other people with disabilities, which never happens in institutions across disability? Um, and I thought I had one related question. Um, Why don't we... I think, sorry, just the last thing on, on institutionalization was, um, it reminds me of the burrito rule that, that gets used as a sign of whether it's an institution. Can you get up at three o'clock in the morning and get yourself a burrito? Um, and so just curious kind of how you, how you see that playing out in, in this issue. Thank we you. We get one more and then we'll come back for a final word to our panelists. I thought it was right here in the gray. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I guess I wanted to see if you guys can like talk a little bit more about the connections between like disability justice and the carceral like system just because i know one of the slides was saying that like a good chunk of people who do suffer from mental illnesses um do wind up in the like carceral system so i wanted to see like how 
you would go about like talking about that and also um, sort of how maybe like defunding one system can really help out like with the funding for this system maybe? I don't know. Thank you very much for that. So let's come back to Alex and Lauren and we'll thank them. Um, you mentioned about the carceral system. It's re I sit on the, I'm the family member on the CARE Act work group that the governor has formed. And it, it, there are nowhere near the amount of people that are being petitioned into the, into um, CARE Court as they thought there would be, which is a good thing because it's giving um, each county time to, to get its sea legs. But one of the strange things that, that they didn't um, think of is that they ha are having people who are in jail, not in prison, but are in jail, are actually filing petitions so that they can become, be brought before the care court and, and receive the promises that are being made in the care court. There are a number of people. Also, the uh, CARE Act did not part did not think that there would be as many family petitioners. How they missed that one, I do not know, but <laughs> they did. And um, so those those are the things that that I see that it, if I had my way, I, I would, when they do the intake in a jail, if someone presents as if they're 5150, could be 5150 or even close to it, it the discussion should stop and they should be sent to the um, psych emergency center or, or emergency room or the standalone psychiatric uh, facility. And that's where, where, where it should begin. Alex? Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I feel there, let me, let me, there, there are sort of several questions on the table. So let me, the language one was something I, I did think about a lot and knew that I got it wrong, but the question was how wrong to get it, in the sense that like the terms itself are so contested, right? Even if you say people with a mental illness, well, some people contest that they have, right? Like the whole point is that there's a debate, you know, so um, I will say that at the end of everyone I interviewed for this, I asked them this question of like, how do you think, what, what are the words that speak to you on this topic? Like, how do you want to describe this? And um, mental like for the, the people who had experienced involuntary treatment, I just I didn't hear like mental health disabilities that often. Um, and I, I think that's there. It's interesting. Um, and I don't you know, and I think there's this, you know, there's the question of sort of people first language. I think disabled people has caught up, but like mentally ill person still feels very, you know, something that people are very comfortable with. So I, the language question, I think, is fraught and I don't necessarily think I got it right and I appreciate that feedback. Um, I think the, you know, looking at something like this, I will say I don't, I don't hear anyone in the mental health space saying we should take some of the money from developmental, people with developmental disabilities and bring it over to the mental health world. I think it's a, we would like to have parity with that. Obviously the sad situation we're in is when this, these things do become zero sum. But I think there's more we could learn than just the money piece of this. That, like, I've had some interesting conversations about services for, again, for this pop, this group of people, for people who have you know very serious you know behavioral issues, but are in placements that are not locked, but with two-on-one -on -one staffing or with like plexiglass window. You know that there are actually like a whole lot of design innovations and staffing innovations that I would I think there's there are things that to be to be learned from that are not necessarily being learned from in the, the mental health space. And I wish I had more time to learn about that. Um, you're, well, we are, you're, you're, we are at time. In fact, okay. at time. So I just want to thank all of you. I want to thank the uh, UC Berkeley Social Science Matrix for putting on this really important California spotlight on conservatorship. I want to recommend, along with Lauren, that you read this book because it really is totally. totally apropos to our situation. and. I'd like to invite you to help me thank our two panelists for this terrific discussion. And I'm very happy if you have comments or feedback or questions or critiques, please send them. I, I would be very, uh, I, I could sell you a copy right here, I suppose, but yeah. But thank you very much for your time and for coming.